Um, okay, so this talk, really, I'm, I'm just going to give some of the background on this talk. This, this is about detecting, um, just for everybody's purposes, radio sort of fast transient events like pulsars and, and other interesting uh, detections using ODT as sort of a metadatabase pi pipeline or uh, processing pipeline. And so myself, Andrew Hart, Luca Cinquini, David Thompson, Kerry Wagstaff, and Shakay uh, Kudyakin is uh, the people who did this. So the impetus for uh, this was an initiative that we had at JPL for, uh, well, three years, really, an internal strategic R&TD initiative, uh, basically making JPL sort of pay attention and be more competitive uh, with the next generation radio arrays. Why does anyone care about radio astronomy or astronomy in general? Most, if you look at what the types of challenges that they're going to have to face with respect to big data over the next decade, they're really pushing the boundaries uh, in many ways for um, uh, what we're going to have to deal with. I mean, the, the SKA is a classic example, you know, with numbers potentially at the level of 700 terabytes of data per second, you know, and having to come up with ways to do things like intelligent triage and stuff like that. But even today, with instruments in Europe, like LOFAR, the Low Frequency Array, which is generating 138 terabytes of data per day, that they're keeping a lot of it around because astronomers have realized, as opposed to their philosophy before, that the sky was the archive, and if you missed it, you could kind of always go re-image it, you know, the next time you were there, because with these fast transient events and with time domain astronomy, people are realizing that time does matter within that domain, and you have to pay attention to that. So the goal, the leaders of the Radio Array Initiative were uh, Bob Preston, who's our chief technologist for um, Interplanetary Network Directorate, I'm sorry, chief scientist, and then Dayton Jones, who was the initiative lead for that. And it was to basically make JPL uh, and our projects more competitive for these next generation radio astronomical instruments because we felt that they were going to be very important to us. And so it was like three thrusts defined in the, um, uh, three thrusts defined as part of the initiative. One of them initially was data mining and intelligent triage algorithms. Another one was on low power hardware because as it turned out in certain situations, if we can improve on the power of the hardware, we can save on the order of tens of millions of dollars per month because many of these um, these next generation radio astronomy instruments or astronomy instruments have power draws that are that high because they're generating that much data and someone's got to pay for the power and a lot of these are in developing countries and things like that and they don't have the money to do that and so if you can design intelligent hardware and instruments that are low voltage and for certain scenarios and certain operations you can save ten million dollars a month and that's important to people. And so it started out as those and then we were kind of hired on later on to do data archiving realizing that Archiving was an important part of understanding, uh, you know, these these um, these next generation instruments. So these were the different areas I kind of talked about. Some of them that the Radio Array Initiative was kind of important for. Um, we have a new initiative at JPL in Big Data. Um, some of the elements of that have drawn from the Radio Array Initiative, especially on the astronomy side, but also looking at Earth and other challenges, uh, you know, that have that, that, you know, we have to deal with in that. And so this work is part of that initiative. And these are the types of challenges like the SKA, but also like rapid science algorithm integration, some of the stuff that we heard about for the SNOW project that we were talking about sort of earlier. Also the types of stuff that Luca was talking about when he was talking about our system grid, you know, um, types of stuff that Andrew was talking about when he talked about solar and, and all those types of things. So um, I, um, I think I'm going to hand it over to Luca now, and uh, Luca is going to talk about the VFaster project. Okay, so yeah, so I'm here to start talking about VFaster, and then Andrew will follow me and you know conclude the talk about VFaster and uh, um, come okay. talk about conclusions. I probably should say on this side. Okay, so all right, so what is VFaster? So VFaster stands for uh, VLB, uh, VLBA Fast Radio Transients. So it's this project going on, uh, you know, at GPL and in other institutions that's dedicated to detecting these very fast radio pulses coming hopefully from extraterrestrial sources. And uh, they did- and I hope. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, no, we know that they're coming from- well, We do, yes. Let, let, let not on camera. That. Not that's camera. right, let me come to that. <laughs> <laughs> Extra the rest of source can be anything, though, right? Uh, but maybe. <laughs> so, okay. So, um, so the idea is actually to, to uh, mine the data that's taken by the VLBA for other purposes and to try to detect this, this burst on this data that's you know, uh, on, our, on, our, on disk. Um, so, as far as sources, where could these? So, these are very, very short passes, about you know, uh, a few milliseconds, and they could come from known and unknown sources. 
we know that there are objects in the sky that produce this burst. These are, you know, pulsars, intermittent pulsars, X-ray binaries, and supernova. Now, we expect bursts from these sources. But, you know, the hope is to detect these things that Chris was just mentioning, you know, things that the people have just speculating about, things like, you know, merging neutron stars, neutron stars, annihilating black holes. I don't even know what that means, but, you know, <laughs> if we find it's great. And, you know, maybe signals from you know, other civilizations, you know, and it's not impossible, I guess. And the idea, you know, even you know, another possibility is to define to totally new categories of deep, deep space objects and things that people have not observed before. So VFASTER is really one of these new categories of experiments that are you know, aimed at uh, uh, mapping the dynamic radio sky. So this is, you know, in, in the past, in traditionally, radio astronomy experiments are about you know, mapping static sources that we know about. We are now actually looking at doing, at, you know, trying to identify things that are very, very transient in nature. So I mentioned the VLBA. VLBA stands for Very Large Baseline Array. It's a set of 10 very large radio telescopes. I know each of them is about 25 meters in diameter. And these tel telescopes are distributed across the US from Hawaii on the west to the Virgin Islands on the east. Um, they are located such that uh, no, uh, no antenna uh, can see, no, no antenna sits on the local horizon of each other antenna. So they're very separate from each other. And the overall baseline of the whole instrument is about 800, 800 kilometers, and therefore the instrument can actually achieve very high resolutions of about a milliard second. So um, that's the VLBA. VFASTER uses a commensal, which means passive approach, to detecting these, these, uh, these pulses. So data is taken by the VLBA anyhow, you know, for other scientific purposes, and it's then, you know, it goes to a processing pipeline at the DNRO, N N -O, uh, in uh, Socorro, New Mexico. And uh, no, as part of the processing, you know, the, what, as part of the processing, what actually happens is that the signals from the different antennas are time correlated. They are corrected for dispersion in the interstellar medium. They are also separated from the noise. But the net result is that after flowing through the correlator, data um, sits on disk for the, uh, for the faster to analyze and can only sit here for a limited number of time because uh, amount of time because uh, no, these are pretty big uh, um, pretty big uh, data directories and the space here is limited so the VFASTER people only have about 30 days to actually select the interesting events from the pool of noise and archive these events for later inspection um, so there is a team of scientists you know, that's distributed around the world whose job is to you know every night or every day they actually go to, um, their job is to inspect these pr promising candidates and you know, flag the ones that you know, could be interesting events from the ones that actually can be disregarded. And this is actually a really international team. It's composed by people in the Netherlands, people in Australia, and uh, uh, people at two institutions in the US. One is JPL, the other is uh, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in, in New Mexico. Um, so what we have done here at JPL, so the, the software engineering team at JPL, um, as Chris was saying, what we've done is developing an end-to-end -end system that would actually help the scientists identify and uh, analyze these interesting events. So uh, our system had two major goals. One is you know, this, uh, provide this web environment where people could actually do their analysis uh, um, uh, faster and better. The other goal that actually just came up later was to enable the automatic inspection of these events by a machine agent, by basically a data mining process. So we built this pipeline that, you know, at a very high level has three components. There is a data processing pipeline which takes care of moving uh, the, the data products from NRIO to JPL and then extracting the metadata and archiving a job for inspection. There is a second component, that's the web portal, Andrew will talk about that, that is this web environment where scientists can log in and, uh, and do their analysis. And finally, there is a data mining algorithm that we are not gonna mention very much, but uh, this is actually also a very interesting part of the system because this data mining algorithm, um, every night it goes through all of the events in the pool and tries to automatically tag events based on similar characteristics with other events that have been tagged by humans. So this is kind of a self-learning machine algorithm, uh, which is, you know, precursor to intelligent robots, basically. So um, in order to build this pipeline, we actually looked at the existing frameworks, and in particular, you know, because of our experience with ODT, because it's proven reliability in other science missions, we chose ODT as the, uh, the building blocks of the pipeline. So we talked about ODT yesterday quite a bit, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of details at a very high level. Let me just mention that, you know, well, ODT obviously stands for Object-Oriented Data Technology. Let me just mention that, you know, in my opinion, you know, some of the best, best characteristics of ODT are, you know, its modularity, its configurability, and it, its extensibility. 
and uh, if, why is that? It's written on the slide. Um, ODT is also very used, uh, you know, in very different scientific domains. We talked about that yesterday. Uh, in particular, you know, it's used in earth science, it's used uh, um, in the health sciences, in planetary science, you know, radio astronomy, and so on. So it, it has, a, it, 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 it's really a very flexible architecture that can be applied to many scientific problems. Um, I hope I have your slides because this seems to be an old version of the <laughs> we see. Okay, so this is a very high level picture of the pipeline that we put in place. Um, uh, basically, it's a complete picture of the whole system and uh, um, what I'm gonna do next, I'm gonna actually uh, go into more detail about each single component. But uh, at, at the very high level, what the pipeline does is that it transfers data from NRIO, where it's you know, um, uh, accumulated by the, from the DLBA data stream, the data is transferred to JPL, where it actually goes a processing pipeline composed of the components, and it, uh, there's a, a crawler component, a file manager component, a, a curator component acting on a solar indexing script, and the whole result of this is that the, the promising, okay, all of the events are actually made available to the web portal for scientists to inspect, and uh, uh, the interesting events are tagged and archived back at uh, NRAO. Um, before going into you now describing uh, in detail what the, the, the pipeline does, it's important to keep in mind some considerations. So, um, so as we designed the architecture, we are not completely free. I mean, we, we had some constraints that we had to work with. The first constraint was that we actually had to minimize impact on the NRI, NRIO resources. Um, as I mentioned, WeFaster is a commensal project. You know, it works passively on data that's taken by NRIO anyhow. And uh, uh, as a consequence, you know, we are kind of a guest project at NRIO. So we had to you know, minimize our uses of this storage, uh, CPU, and network bandwidth. The second uh, consideration was security. Um, our system could not in any way uh, expose the NRIO system, compromise it in any way, or touch in any way their, their original data products. So that's why we decided to, you know, instead of doing all of this processing pipeline at NRIO directly, we actually moved all the processing back to JPL and the DNRO data products were only exposed in a read-only mode. That they could not be you know, written in any way. The other thing to consider is that uh, um, as we you know, this project has been going on for maybe a year about, something like that now, and uh, requirements did evolve during this time um, because, you know, because they were, you know, the scientists, Kiri, and uh, actually, I should actually acknowledge, you know, the, the two main, main scientists at JPL are doing, uh, doing this work are Kiri Wagstaff and David Thompson. And, you know, during this time, you know, as they were learning more about the system, they were actually tweaking the um, processing algorithm in front of our system. And as a consequence, we're now, with the passing of time, we got increased data volumes and increased high frequencies that we had to deal with. And uh, no, we had to respond to this and we had to modif modify the pipeline. So for example, uh, one thing we did that we actually switched, well, I should probably talk about that later, but uh, there were some changes to the pipeline as we actually, um, no, as we had to deal with uh, different conditions. So going to be faster data product, um, it's important to understand what a faster data product is. Uh, VFASTER data really is organized at three levels. It's organized as jobs, scans, and events. So a job is a whole set of data that is stored together on disk under one single directory that's named like the job. And this is all the data that's associated with a single scientific investigation. So scientists now require, now scientists go to an error, they ask for you know, permission to you know, observe a certain portion of the sky, and you know, they, 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 they are granted a certain amount of time, and that's a whole job. So all of that uh, observation stay in one directory. Each job consists of one to 100 scans. So a scan is a period of time where all the antennas, you know, these 10 antennas part of the LBA, all the antennas are pointed at the same point in the sky. And typically a scan uh, you know, lasts from you know, one to 100 seconds. Each scan can contain, one, can contain from zero to 100 events. So, most scans don't contain any, so what is an event? An event is a, a portion of time that the system thinks is interesting because it could contain a detection from extraterrestrial sources. Um, each event is about one to two seconds, and each, you know, most scans don't have any events, but a scan can have about 10 events, or they can even have 100 events. Um, and you know, each event, as I was saying, is about two seconds, you know, one to two seconds, but the really interesting part of an event is actually much shorter. It's about you know, 10, 10 milliseconds. It's a, it's a very, very quick burst radio pulse from, from the sky. So this is a very important, a very important distinction. Um, 
Each data product for us is a, a corresponds, so each job corresponds to one single data product, and that's uh, the whole set of files that's under one directory. And uh, um, it's basically, you know, it, you know, it contains calibration files, output files, voltages, the reconstructed images, and it's approximately one to 100 gigabytes. You know, depending on how many events you have in the particular job, you can, you know, you, you can actually be very small or quite large. So what are these events? So this is, exam so this is an example of the events we detect. This is a composed image where you, can, you have uh, each of these lines is the detection from a single telescope. We have nine of these, and you know, they are plotted in different ways. On the x-axis, you have time. On the y-axis, you have either the frequency or the relative signal. And what you can see clearly here is that at this particular point in time, you know, here, all nine, nine of the 10 telescopes clearly saw a radio frequency signal. These, they clearly saw this very, very rapid burst. And uh, it turns out that this is actually a pulsar. So this is, this is a real deep space object that's actually known. So we didn't discover anything new. But the fact that VFASA could detect that is, was actually proof that you know, it's actually working. I mean, the whole, the whole processing is actually working. This is the composite signal from all of the nine, uh, all of the nine telescopes. Nine instead of 10, because there is an algorithm that actually disregards telescopes if they introduce too much noise. That's what's called uh, uh, adaptive, adaptive excision, I guess. So that's a real signal. There's also lots of fake signals. For example, this is a signal called, uh, this is an example of RFI, which stands for radio frequency interference. So in this case, you see that one telescope saw one signal here, but none of the others saw the same signal. So this is the, the signal from one telescope, none of the others saw the same. And um, the reason here is that uh, this signal is actually from terrestrial sources. It's not from aliens or anything like that. There's also, yeah, oh, sorry. There's also signals that we don't understand. So for example, this is a famous signal called the V-chirp. The scene, it's a very weak signal, but it's seen in all the antennas. And uh, um, people are still debating what, what, what that is. You know, and they, they can't really figure it out. But you know, it clearly has a very clear signature. This has no name. I call it the snake. But uh, uh, you know, it's a signal that's seen by one telescope only. So most likely, it's just like a defect or some interference in a particular telescope. It's kind of weird. So let's see how we're doing here. Um, so let's go back to the pipeline. Let's discuss what are the different components that we actually used to build uh, this pipeline. The first of these components is actually not an Apache product, but it's, a very, uh, it's an open source and very useful product called R-Sync that you know, some of you might be familiar with. R-Sync is this Unix utility that allows you to synchronize a remote and a local data directory with very minimal user, user intervention. So basically, uh, what we use R-Sync for is to transfer data products from NRIO to JPL where they were transferred. It's very useful, very easy to set up. It has a bunch of options. It's, a, it's quite high performance uh, um, utility because it, it only transfers differences of files in between uh, different invocations. So it, it, if, it, if one of the files at the source changes, it will not retransfer the whole file, but just what changed. And it's really a, turn, a turnkey solution. I mean, we turned it on a year ago. We never had to touch it again. So that, that, that's just great. Um, so the way we use it in, uh, in uh, VFaster is that uh, we had an RC, RSync server daemon running at uh, NRIO, and which was configured uh, um, with some uh, tight security, re security restrictions. It would all allow connections from JPL host, and it would all allow connections in read-only mode. So you couldn't write to this daemon. Um, at JPL, we had an RSync client that would actually run as a cron job every hour, I think. And so every hour, all, all new products coming from the VLBA were automatically transferred to JPL. Um, the other thing that happened is that uh, because we wanted to minimize impact on NRIO resources, we did not transfer the whole product. The whole product can be from 1 to 100 gigabytes. That was too much. We decided to actually very selectively transfer only those files that would allow scientists to inspect a particular job at the partic those particular events. So basically, by, you know, by deciding which file to transfer, we actually managed to reduce the product from, five, from 50 gigabytes on average to 50 megabytes, so a reduction of three orders of magnitude. And because of that, it turns, and because of that, and because of the transfer fee speed between the two hosts, it turns out we can actually transfer the full product for, for a whole day in just a matter of minutes. So we, we are certainly not data transfer bound. The second component we used is the cast crawler that, you know, we talked about that uh, some, some time yesterday. The crawler is a component, is a, one of the most useful ODT components. It's something that you can use to monitor a, a, a certain staging area 
And as files and products come into the staging area, you can actually submit them automatically to a file manager, to, which is another little component that will come next. So, um, you know, for refaster, we set up this crawler to actually run uh, every, uh, I think it's actually every 300 seconds, every five minutes. The crawler was monitoring this staging directory, and every time, you no, know, these full products arrived from an RIO, it would actually uh, trigger this, the ingestion of these products to the CAS file manager. Um, as many of the components, the crawler has different extension points, and uh, we will heavily average this configurability. And one of the things we did, for example, we, we established a precondition. A job would not be ingested into the file manager unless it was complete. So we had a marker file that uh, only when that marker file was transferred to JPL, the, the crawler would actually trigger the ingestion into the file manager. The other thing that you can do with a crawler, you can, you can have precondition, you can also have a post actions. So after a job has been ingested and after it's been either successful or failed, you can actually trigger some, some piece of code. And the way we use that is that you know, on, post on post ingest success, so if the, the ingestion was successful, we triggered a particular script that transferred the, the metadata from the file manager into a solar instance. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So the second component we use of ODT is the file manager. So this is you now one of the core components of ODT. It's what you typically use to archive, archive data products, uh, extract metadata, and uh, send this metadata to a catalog that you can actually then later query for, um, no, for any, you know, to, to get any information about the job. The file manager also is very configurable, very extensible as all, all ODT components. And the way we use this in, OD, in, in VFaster is that, uh, um, no, well, so there's many ways we use this in VFaster. Um, the first thing we did, we actually find policies uh, that establish which data products were uh, allowed in the system. Um, another decision here was to define one single data product to capture all the metadata for a specific job. So um, we could have done something different. We could have decided that you know, because metadata is divided into job, sorry, because uh, data is largely divided into jobs, scans, and events, we could have defined three different data products, you know, one for job, one for scan, one for an event. But uh, we didn't do so partly because of, uh, because of historical reasons. But the other, the other advantage of doing that, the, the advantage of having one single data product is that if you are a client, you can actually query a file manager for a specific identifier and get all the metadata at once, you know, without having to issue multiple queries. Um, a consequence of our decision was that some of the keys that, so um, I should say that when metadata is ingested in file manager, you need to reduce it to key values pairs because that's the underlying model in the CAS file manager. Because we only had one data product and because not the number of scans in a product and number of events in a scan is variable, so it's not known a priori, we actually had to define meta dynamic metadata keys. So we had our metadata that defines things like, you know, the start time for, uh, for, for, for events for scan six is, you know, a certain number of values. So these keys were dynamically defined. This also meant that we had to do something with the validation layer. The validation layer is that component of the file manager that uh, ensures that once you ingest a product, all those metadata fields are really there. So it would uh, typically reject the product if those, if, the, if those keys are not found. But because the keys are not known a priori, we had to define a linear behavior for this, for this uh, plugin, and we basically had to tell, you know, ingest the metadata even if, you know, you don't really know about these keys. Um, we actually had to define our own metadata extractor. That's a typical thing, you know. Uh, in, in the file manager, we have this pluggable configuration where you decide, you know, whenever you ingest a product, that you decide which piece of code to run to extract the metadata appropriately. And you know, our VFAST metadata extractor looked into the data directory. They, they knew, they know how to parse each, you know, each kind of file and ingest all the metadata into the file manager. Um, the other thing that happened is that, you know, the metadata catalog, um, uh, that is something that's also configurable in the file manager. We started with the default Lucene implementation, but you know, as the frequency of metadata ingestion become, became higher and higher, and as the frequency of updates became higher, we actually had to switch to a relational database because we had a problem at the time in the curator. Um, so we switched from Lucene to MySQL, and later on we went back and we fixed the curator to also deal with these uh, high transfer uh, updates. And as far as data transfer, you know, uh, what we decided is that uh, uh, typically in the file manager, you move uh, data products from a staging area to an archive area, and you decide how that archive area should be structured. 
But what we actually had to do in Vifasa, we actually archived them in place because you know, if we move them, they are seeing a, product, they are seeing a demon would actually transfer them to the same location. So that's, that's, how, that's what we did. Um, the third component I'm going to talk about is curator. So curator is this ODT component that, that is a web application that uh, sits in front of the file manager and it allows both humans, oops, both humans and, and machines to submit uh, a request to the curator to uh, modify the metadata in the file manager. So it really comes with two interfaces. Uh, one is a web interface that's typically used by humans and this web interface, this is a you know, representation of that interface, the web interface will allow you to you know, select the data product from you know, your staging area, drop them onto, these, uh, um, onto this panel here on the right, and, you know, uh, accumulate a certain number of products. For each product, you decide on which metadata, metadata extractor to run. And then you trigger um, a full job that ingests all those products at once into the file manager. So that's one of the ways you can use Curator. But the way we use it in uh, VFaster is different. In VFaster, we use the second way, the second interface exposed by the curator, which is a web RESTful API. So um, this capability is built on top of Apache JAX-RS. And uh, um, what, it, what it is is that uh, the curator web application has endpoints, you know, URLs like this, metadata slash update, that you can actually invoke you know, from a script, or from a client, from anything, to change, modify, or add metadata to an existing product. So if you wanted to actually add a name value pair to an existing product, you would simply you know, invoke this URL, pass in as post parameters the product identifier and the name value, and this would actually be added to the existing metadata. In the faster, this is actually, uh, this capability is invoked twice. Uh, it, it's invoked by both the, uh, both the, the VFaster portal and uh, the uh, machine, the data mining script. So um, as Andrew will actually show, you know, from the VFaster, humans can go and they, you know, tag metadata, uh, basically decide on tags to add metadata to an event. And the data mining uh, algorithm does that nightly. The data mining algorithm nightly goes through the whole pool of events in the database, decides which ones are worth tagging, and sends these instructions to the curator, which then updates the file manager, and at the same time triggers a re-ingestion of the metadata into Solar. Um, finally, the last component I'm going to talk about before leaving the stage is Apache Solar. Originally, we didn't have these in the system, and uh, we were simply querying the product metadata to the CAS file manager, but it turns out that uh, you know, as, we, we, as we had increasing uh, demand for high-frequency querying to the system, uh, the file manager was simply not able to actually support those, and we had to move to a, a more, um, more uh, high-performance solution. So we looked at this, you know, we, we dis since we were already familiar with Apache Solar, which is you know, a, a very known Apache product, we decided to use it into our system. So um, Apache Solar, you know, it's a very high performance search engine built on top of Lucene. We talked about that yesterday. Um, it allows, you know, text queries, faceted queries. Um, it also has, you know, high fe you know, advanced features like, you know, highlighting, work completion, and stuff like that. And uh, um, underneath, uh, the solar model is very similar to uh, the CAS metadata model. You store metadata is key, multiple value pairs. Uh, it's also a very scalable component that you, know, you can scale to tens and hundreds of millions of records, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, but the way we use the uh, solar in, uh, um, in VFaster is the following. Basically, uh, we, the reason is that we wanted to enable very fast, uh, very high frequency querying by the clients. And the clients are the portal and the data mining script. Um, so what we did, we actually uh, were running a solar instance within the same Tomcat that's hosting the curator application. And uh, um, this, uh, basically, this solar instance, the, the metadata is ingested from the, CAS, uh, from the CAS catalog into solar in two conditions. When a job is first ingested, the CAS crawler, as I was mentioning, after a job is ingested, the CAS crawler will trigger this solar index in the indexing script, which retrieves metadata from there and move it all the way to here. Um, also, when, a job, when, a, when, a job is, when an event is tagged to be interesting with, the, you know, with the, as, as either a pulsar or an RFI or anything like that, um, the cast curator, uh, curator itself uh, triggers again this indexing script, which takes all the metadata again from here and replaces the existing metadata into solar. Um, and the way this works is this, through this JAXRS filter that allows you know, the, the response to be intercepted 
on the outgoing, uh, on the outgoing channel. Um, so this worked really well for us. Um, as we move metadata from the file manager into solar, if you remember I said that in the file manager, each job is, uh, uh, is represented in one single blob of metadata. In order to query the metadata better, as we move the metadata from here to here, we actually decided to split each single metadata blob into many records. So you ingest metadata into solar as XML record, and what we are doing within the script is that uh, um, the full metadata for a job it is split into records that uh, are flagged as job, scan, and event. So each single metadata record here becomes many metadata records here, and this allows us to actually better query the metadata because we can issue uh, queries for, um, for example, we can ask the system what are all the latest products uh, ingesting the system by date, um, what is the full metadata for a single job, a single scan, or a single event, or also we can ask questions like what are all the events in the system that are detected as pulsars, or detected as RFI, or detected as anything else. And you know, as more, use, as more humans are going to use the system and are going to you know, insert new tags that we still don't know about, we can actually ask things like, what are all the tags that humans have assigned to these events? And get the list of those tags. So at this point, I'm going to leave the stage for Andrew, who's going to talk about the, the web portal that uses all this infrastructure. Thanks, Luca. Um, OK, so Luca has done a great job of sort of laying out the backend system and why we've constructed it the way that we have. What I'm going to talk about a little bit is the way that users of the system, more specifically the vFaster Science data team, will um, take advantage of the system and basically how they will interact with it. Um, for the longest time, the team had been doing things basically by remotely logging in uh, through command line and in investigating metadata and jobs that way. This portal was meant as a way to make it a little bit more flexible and a little bit more standardized and to facilitate collaboration um, between the team. Uh, so the team, just to be more specific, is distributed around the globe. Um, so there's obviously the issue of time zones, but there's also um, just, just collaborating is difficult and providing a single shared environment where these people could take a look at things was important. So the, the system that Luca just laid out here at a high level um, follows, the data follows this process that roughly goes from ups, upstream product acquisition through to staging and archiving and cataloging. And what the web portal is designed to do is to provide a largely read-only view of the information the latest information that was captured the previous evening, but also an archive of all of the information that has been captured, or rather the metadata that's been captured up to date. And I think it's important to mention that what is, like Lucas said, we had to be good neighbors, essentially, and be very careful about how much of NRAO's resources that we were taking. Um, and so the information, while we were, while the raw voltage data off of the upstream antennas is on the order of gigabytes to terabytes. The information that we collect at, on the JPL side is on the order of megabytes, hundreds of megabytes per night. And it consists mostly of this raw metadata and the image uh, data that Luca was showing you later, earlier where you can see the um, visual representation of what the antennas see. So what do we build? Uh, we've built the portal off of a number of different Apache products. Um, obviously, ODT forms a lot of the back end, but there is um, a web framework called Balance, which is a component of ODT, and Shake is going to give a talk on that later this afternoon. That sort of, sort of serves as the uh, substrate for the portal. Um, we're using Solar for search, as uh, Luca mentioned, and we both take advantage of the HTTP server and Tomcat. So if you were taking a look at the portal and you were to come in as a, as a science team member, this would be the first screen. Um, essentially, what you see is the latest detection data expressed as sort of very high-level information, as well as an indication of both how many scans were run and how many total events were detected um, by the automated detecting machinery. If you dig into a particular scan, you start to see some scan-level metadata, what job the scan belonged to, where in the sky the scan was looking, um, and some information that helps you anchor uh, the scan in time as well as an indication of how many events uh, you know, th were flagged by the system. So if we dig in one more, 
you can see what it would look like for an individual event. Uh, again, you have that same level context metadata, but now more specific to this individual event, you've got uh, the ability to download um, the full resolution imagery to sort of take a really close look at it. But you're starting to see again what, um, what Luca was showing earlier about what these antennas are actually looking at. And somebody who's a reviewer is gonna be taking a look at this and they can by virtue of the fact that they've looked at thousands of these over the years, very quickly, as in within a matter of you know five to ten seconds, usually, classify this as either a being of interest or not of interest. And if it's not interesting, they move on. If it is interesting, they are now able to do something called tagging. And tagging, as Luca said, is a way to associate some description, some descriptive metadata with a particular event that will later allow for its classification um, as either being something of scientific interest or something that should not have been flagged in the first place. And that filtering is interesting uh, because it helps to classify things, but it also is used to train the, um, the machine learning algorithms that were doing the initial classification so that right now the human is absolutely the bottleneck. The, the human in the loop doing the review is only there because they want to be sure that they're not missing anything and the confidence in the AI algorithms isn't there yet that they can just trust that. Um, the human in the loop tagging then is sort of a, a supervised learning technique where they can go um, and use this information to iteratively improve the underlying algorithms with the idea that ultimately they'll have enough confidence in there that the workload for the human reviewers goes down. Um, so this, on the interface, if somebody's gotten done looking at something, they have the ability to associate tags for the event. And Luca went over sort of the difference. The machine is going and adding its, what it, its best guess of what it is, and those will show up as gray tags. Uh, I'm sorry, those will show up as blue tags. And then it, uh, tags entered by uh, a human science team reviewer will um, show up as gray. So what can users do in this portal now? By and large, it's a read-only view. It's just what data was collected, let me take a look at it. But what we're starting to get is this ability to start of feed information back into the system and allow it to affect the future performance and sort of improve the performance of the, f of the system in the future. One of the things that we, they can't do quite yet, but that we will do is to use the portal as a initiator for what to archive. So I mentioned that the upstream data is many, many, many uh, gigabytes and sometimes many terabytes of data. We have a limited s amount of space on that system that we've been granted to run this experiment. And so I have to be sort of judicious about what, in what data we keep for long-term offline analysis. Um, the criteria for what is kept and what is thrown away is entirely dependent on what's interesting to the scientists. And right now, there's sort of a duality where the scientists will use the portal for this rapid viewing of information and even providing these taggings, but then they'll still log into the system and actually physically perform the archive or, or, or flush the data from the disk. And one of the things that we want to do is to make this a little bit more fluid in the sense that once they've tagged something, the system will then use a set of metrics or rules to understand that if such and such has been tagged as interesting, the corresponding job should be archived. Um, so what have users thought so far? We've had this particular interface in production for about eight months now, and we've had a chance to get a lot of feedback and to work with that. By and large, people seem to find that the interface is an improvement over the terminal-based stuff where they'd have to pull up um, using an X window, some, you know, the images sort of one by one, having them in a web-based interface is really great. They can just scroll through these things. One of the feedbacks that we got the most uh, was that they really wanted us to minimize clicks. So those screens that I showed you in the beginning where you're sort of serially, serially looking at an event one by one um, is actually not the way that they would prefer to work. And so we've developed an alternative view specifically for the process of reviewing a job wherein all of the imagery for all of the events just loads in a, in a never-ending stream, somewhat like your, your Facebook page, as you keep scrolling, more stuff keeps showing up. Although we do load it all at once because some of those people really scroll fast and the, the lag of, of waiting, of waiting is, is, can be really painful. Um, so minimizing clicks was one of the things that, w that we took as, as um, 
criticism for this, and so we've, we've tried to improve that. And we've even had experiences where uh, reviewers have been able to see something on their mobile phone because they're traveling or whatnot. They don't have access to the full environment of their, of their workstations, and they've, they found that to be quite useful. Uh, so what's next for, th for this interface in particular is to do sort of what Lucas said at the very end of his portion, which is to take advantage of some of the power of solar to afford these people you know, flexible search, faceting by different tag values so that they can pull down different collections, um, search by different index metadata. Because what we're doing right now is we're utilizing the portal primarily for the information that just came in, you know, what last night's data essentially. Um, but over time, as this volume grows and as we get more and more information in there, it's going to become increasingly important to say, hey, I'd like to see all the things that actually were marked as a pulsar and sort of get a sense of those independently. Or I'd like to see this category or that category. And so providing, since solar makes it so easy to do, um, it's really just a matter of wiring it into the interface at this moment. And then, like I said, uh, we'll try and keep, keep improving the efficiency to keep up with these, the science team. and. Um, implement the system to support the automatic uh, archiving of data back into the, into the permanent offline archive. So I think, I think that about wraps it up for, for the presentation. Um, it would, any and all of us would be happy to take questions. Right now, you guys are mostly focused on grabbing data from existing archives, extracting it, and then running the, you know, um, your algorithms on that. So, you know, as you get closer to the SKA and some of those other things, we've got to insert data sampling algorithms upstream as we're collecting data. Can we use ODT to do that? Can we use the workflow infrastructure to actually, as part of firing off these agents as the data is coming in, streaming into the archive centers, or where would we put that? You guys thought about that? I have thoughts. I don't know what these guys no, go ahead. Actually. Oh, okay. I'll, I, I was, yeah. My my thoughts, my thoughts on that are that when I originally talked to Carrie and Dave about doing this a couple of years ago, one of the things that we discussed was their jobs are Python jobs right now, the way they are doing the upstream. Like their 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 code runs at the instrument correlator, and so. But the problem, is, not the problem, but just the way that they did it is that they wrote that part themselves. And so they did intend at some point like to figure out if they could use any of the ODT things like upstream at the instrument correlator, like running in some cases on like, like you know, the hardware itself. Um, and I think that they would have done that because that they could run Python on there so they can run Java or the JVM or at least portions of it. And we talked to them about that. We just never did it. Um, but yes, that's because of the way that it's been delineated between what these guys have been talking about, the way that we work with them. like. We've been focused, yeah, like on the downstream stuff with the intention, yeah, to grow like like for SK, like you said, Dan, to the upstream stuff and also in the interim for LSST. So LSST is, is another fast transient potential type of thing because they're going to get like four, 20 to 40 terabytes a night and then they're going to go process it offline like the next whatever. And so we talked to the LSST people about potentially using this for that too. It might be interesting to benchmark uh, how, how we can scale on you know the front end of this whole thing, right? So that you can figure out how much data you can actually capture, um, over, you know, over time, and how how the workflow infrastructure could be used to actually support that. So. Just yep. Agreed. Thanks. Hi, I liked your talk. My question is going the other way. <clears throat> what if you were looking at data and you decided that the snake is a really important artifact of a cosmic event that just got discovered? How flexible is the system to kind of go back into your huge archives and try to extract all instances of snake? So that's a great point. And, and I think one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that obviously it has to do with the fact that we are not gathering the original information. We are, we are simply piggybacking on information that's being gathered in the context of other experiments. So that's what Luca was saying when he said this is a commensal experiment, is that every night these experiments are being generated by other people. We as VFaster does not control, for example, the pointing source at any point in time. It doesn't control what's being looked at. It simply has access to the data that's being captured by other, by other researchers. Furthermore, what we end up doing with that data is taking a look at something like what, like this snake. So if this snake shows up, right, this snake pattern shows up, 
we have access for the next, I don't know, less than a month or so to that data and have that time to make a decision about whether to keep or whether to destroy that data. And I think the, to get to your point, which is, which is how do you go back and find something else that's similar? I think the way to address that is to become a little bit more expressive with the tags that we've developed. So for example, right now, if, if, that, if that snake thing is, dis is determined to be interesting and it's not garbage, and it, but it's just unknown, and we tag that as, I don't know, I have no idea what this is, but it's potentially interesting. And it's interesting enough that it's worth archiving that data and that data gets archived, then we can do exactly what you're saying. Um, but I think it's going to be a text-based search at the moment because the information, the individual jobs are archived as sort of self-contained units, and the information about what's in those little units is all of this metadata. But, but, is it, but isn't it true, so I'm not totally sure about this, but I think that after a month that we actually lose any data that was taken, right? So you would be able to get the snake uh, to run this algorithm and find the snakes only for the past previous 30 days, right? I think. Um, yeah, so this is, this is an area in which it would be really helpful to have the actual scientists um, yeah, here because, no, right, but, well, I mean, b primarily because what we've been building is the metadata analysis framework, not so much the data analysis side of things. And well, so, and it's also within the context, it's, it's also within the context of this experiment. That's right. Yeah, so maybe thinking more broadly, which is maybe what you're doing or whatever, too, like, like, so they're going around, like, the upstream scientists, scientists, like, machine learning people, so it's a combination of computer scientists as well as, like, radio astronomers and then experts and that, too. The machine learning people that they kind of sit in between us and like more data, like data ops or data processing, whatever, and then, then the scientists sit in between them, like the NRAO people or the people in Australia or yada yada, the other people, the actual radio astronomers. And so, but what they've been doing is going around pitching this approach to like other groups, like the LSST people, like the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, um, and, then, and then to others, like LOFAR in the Europe, like the Low Frequency Array, which LOFAR has an existing transient pipeline. But in those types of cases, just for V faster, yes, we don't keep the data around because like this isn't like a hundred million dollar funded project, it's more of a smaller science research effort. In those other hundred million dollar funded projects or whatever, the suggestion is to use something like this to do precisely what you're saying. To, to then suggest, yes, like to keep the data around, period, and then use this to dictate and drive initially text-based search or whatever of the tags for the machine learning, but eventually into the bits themselves using things like CAS or APES or things like that. It occurs to me as you're saying that, that there might be some real synergy you could gain with these guys for tracking simultaneous events against different frequency observations or right. across these different groups. Right. Good luck with that. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, so it's 12.06, so technically we've got nine minutes. It's lunchtime, so you can go early to lunch if you want or if anyone has any questions. Any more? All right, early to lunch. Thank you. Pretty good in this place.